Thank you. Well, this morning, your ministers are going to attempt the impossible. We are going to try and share our spiritual journeys with you in 2,000 words apiece. We borrowed this idea from another ministerial team and set it ourselves to it without it now seems thinking quite hard enough about how many words a spiritual journey really takes. However, there is an iron rule in our business which goes like this. Every seventh day, a Sunday. Being two different people, we will set about this task in two different ways. Since I've been here for a while, and many, if not most of you know something of my journey of changing beliefs, I'm going to talk about my journey through a variety of spiritual practices. And Angela is going to talk about her call to ministry. We share these slivers of our journey with you so that you will know us better and so that you will be prompted to consider your own journey through faith and practice and calling. Both of us feel blessed by the opportunity to reflect on our lives with you and hope you will feel blessed in the hearing. When I was about five years old, <clears throat> I asked my mother if we could say grace before dinner. I don't know where I had learned about this practice. Maybe they did it on Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> but I had learned about it, and I wanted to do it. I remember my mother's look of surprise. She, to this day, feels very little need for the trappings of spirituality. However, she is a fair and open-minded person, and she said, of course we could say grace before dinner. I was aware that she might have said no, and glad that she had said yes. But then I discovered that what she did about it was to add another column to the family chore chart, <laughs> grace. <laughs> and it put Chris in the box <laughs> for the whole month. And that was a problem. Because in spite of this uncohate longing I had to say grace, I didn't know how to do it, or really even what it was. And so when I was asked that night at dinner if I was ready to say grace, I somehow demurred, embarrassed, and that was the end of grace in the Robinson household. <laughs> the column disappeared from the chore chart, Venus. I recount this story with a profound appreciation for the mystery of parenting. For the deep knowledge, both as the child of two earnest parents and the mother of an earnest 21-year-old, of how profoundly we are shaped by the match and the mismatch between parent and child. It was when my parents realized that we were going to learn about religion on the street, if they didn't get us a more formal education, that we started going to the Unitarian Church a few years later. I loved it from the beginning, and I kept going after other family members dropped out one by one. It seems that I alone of my family of origin have the sort of spiritual need and sense that is met in religious community. This particular UU church was steeped to its core in humanism and in the social changes that were roiling in Washington, D.C. in the 1960s. I owe a lot to that church. It taught me to trust my own intuitions and to love the world and to work for justice, it taught me about beautiful music and quiet spaces and thinking for myself. But they didn't say grace either, or pray, or meditate, or delve really in any way into the life of the spirit. So what I have learned about nurturing my spirituality, I have learned elsewhere. From music teachers and books about Jewish boys and from my best friend in college who embraced Hinduism, from a stint with a boyfriend who kept a kosher household, and from the Methodists who provided my seminary education, although not as much there as you might think, and ministerial colleagues and interfaith clergy support groups, a lot of that, really, a lot. And more books, and you, over the years, what you have told me of your own spiritual life and practices, and what you have asked about mine. The people of my internship church, the first parish of Belmont, Massachusetts, 
introduced me into, in the end to the topic of spiritual practice in a study group of a book with the formidable name, A Celebration of Discipline, by the evangelical Quaker named Richard Foster. Like the people in this group, I felt a kind of appalled attraction to this rather stern author and to his disciplines of meditation, prayer, fasting, and ten more. From this book and our discussion about it, I realized that corporate worship is a spiritual discipline. I had years before adopted the practice of attending worship, not because I was attracted to the subject, but because it was Sunday. I had found it enriching, as I know many of you do. And I was thrilled to realize in this discussion group that I had stumbled upon a spiritual discipline all by myself. Secondly, I was introduced to tithing as a spiritual discipline. Tithing is the practice of giving away a set proportion of one's income, traditionally 10%, but it's the set proportion part that matters rather than the proportion you set. It's really an excellent practice for a starving student to adopt because it allows one to feel really good, if not downright superior, about one's necessarily small contributions. And it sets the stage for a lifetime of the satisfactions of generosity. The study group discussed tithing in detail in the modern world and discovered, dis concluded that a modern tithe might be 5% of our income going to the church and 5% to other good causes, tax deductible and not, outside of the church. It is a profoundly satisfying and very simplifying way to live a life, which I highly recommend. Finally, we realized that a particular kind of study is a spiritual discipline. And that idea has also followed me through my life. Mr. Foster focused on the study of scripture, but we UUs know that there is wisdom and holiness all over the place, in many scriptures and in secular literatures also. Spiritual study, to put it briefly, is study not so much for learning as for deepening. It's a matter of spending time mulling over the meaning of passages rather than the devouring of entire books and letting them day by day speak to one's life. Meditative reading is another name for this kind of study. Study was a mainstay of the religious practice of the transcendentalists, our own religious forebears, and this was my cup of tea. We also talked about meditation, and I did learn something about meditation and fasting. I tried that once. Prayer, none of us could make anything out of his enthusiasm for prayer. Confession, that's where the appalled really took over. <laughs> I was already out of seminary by this time of this study group, and it was my first introduction to spirituality, and it was wonderful. And oddly enough, or maybe not so oddly, because I've heard this story many times before. No sooner had I discovered this treasure trove of real information about how to grow in spirit, I entered a long hiatus of spiritual practices. I graduated from seminary, took my first church, bought my first car and then house, and I got married, participated on a master swimming team, learned my trade, enjoyed being a young star, and then I moved to a, well, let's just say it was a particularly challenging church, had a baby, did my work, learned a lot, nearly killed myself. I remember telling a retired colleague that I knew I had to change my life while recovering from the first of what would be four surgeries for three illnesses in five years. She asked me a few questions about what had worked for me in the past, latched on to that meditative reading, gave me a subscription to a quarterly collection of meditative readings, mostly from secular sources. She suggested ditching the idea of spiritual disciplines, which I was berating myself for not having, in favor of spiritual practices. Spiritual disciplines are the things you require yourself to do every day because you think it's good or you're supposed to do that. Spiritual practices, on the other hand, you do because you want to, because you miss it if you don't, because it feels right and yields fruit in your lives. The trick to spiritual disciplines is to discipline yourself to do them. The trick to spiritual practices 
is to find the things that work and to change them when they don't. What I quickly found was that if I spend time with myself in the morning, almost every morning, that feeds me, changes me, nourishes my ministry. Over 15 years now, I have mostly done meditative reading of various texts in the morning, but there were a few years of Zen-style sitting meditation, a few years of prayer, a lot of journaling. The content of the practice has changed. I've learned to recognize the symptoms of needing a new form of practice, sleeping late. <laughs> when I found the right practice, it's the best time of the day. This was not a feat of self-discipline any more than the 30 to 90 minutes I spend eating every day are self-discipline. It's what I want to do, feel drawn to do, missed it when I didn't do, was hungry for. Fulfilled something which I have noticed needing in myself since, well, since that little run in with saying grace at the age of five. A few years into this practice, something odd happened. I had a spiritual experience. It didn't happen in this time of morning study. It happened during a continuing education event for ministers. And the only way I could describe it to myself as to what would, was happened was I felt God's love. Now, I didn't, before that experience, really believe in the kind of God who's active in our lives or available to do something like love. But I could find no other words for my experience. And what I learned at my mother's knee was to trust myself and to be open-minded. And so my morning time was spent in theological thinking for a while and reading in contemplative and mystical practices. Participated in a Jewish Christian meditation and prayer group for several years, hoping that that stern discipline would entice that wonderful experience to come back again. And I learned enough about the spiritual life in those years. Oh my goodness, what they hadn't taught us in seminary. I learned enough to learn that that sort of experience which I had had is classically rare and can't be enticed back. And while I was wallowing in sadness about that, someone suggested that I study the book of Psalms. Now, the book of Psalms is notoriously uneven in its spiritual content. And good heretic that I am, I began, Thomas Jefferson style, by simply cutting out the parts I found objectionable. <laughs> and then after getting tired of all the masculine language, I started doing my own degenderized version. And one thing led to another, and day followed day for about five years. And eventually, I had my own book of Psalms. Faithful, I felt, to the original in spirit, but updated in nature. I made a blog out of it just for kicks in my sabbatical before last, and for the past five years, that blog has gotten about 25 hits a day and regular thank you emails. Because of that blog, several of these psalms have been used in Christian and interfaith worship, set to music, and are used in a book of night prayers by a small convent of cloistered nuns in New Jersey. <laughs> But by the time all that happened, my own spirituality had moved away from a mystical quest for a relationship with a personal God, which I still seem to believe in, but our relationship had become more distant. It alighted on the Tao Te Ching, 80 short poems from China of 2,500 years ago. I studied a poem a day from one of several sources for several years, eventually found myself intrigued with the idea of summing up the morning's insight in a tweet, which brings with it the absolute discipline of 140 characters. My Twitter followers and Facebook friends kept asking for a book of these tweets, and over my last sabbatical I did some editing, and my husband William did a graphic design, and together we created the Twitter DAO. William will be selling copies on the patio after the service if you're interested. And he also has at that table a set of basic instructions for spiritual study or meditative reading for those of you who think you might like to try something like that. And now I am in transition again 
working once again on that major challenge of spiritual practice, which is discovering what will work to sustain my life these days. I'm experimenting with Tai Chi and a return to a more formal kind of meditation at the moment. We'll see. I have come to trust that the right thing for me will emerge if I remain open to all possibilities, just as it has all along. My spiritual autobiography begins where I grew up, on Alder Street in Dundee, Oregon, below the rolling vineyards of Yamhill County, up a little hill from our town's gas station, which was only in business about half the time, and up the hill from the Little Orange Store, a convenience store that probably had an actual name, where we took our pennies to buy candy cigarettes. Remember those? The little puff of powdered sugar that would come out at the end. Could you imagine it? <laughs> Awful. <laughs> this was a working class neighborhood in the grittiest sense. A pocket of trailer homes, many of which were made of aluminum with a few cul-de-sacs. There were two churches I knew about within walking distance of our street, both Christian, and one offered vacation Bible school in the summers. All of the neighborhood kids went to it, so we did too, even though my dad was an atheist and my mom probably in the category of spiritual but not religious. And we'd get stickers and candy in exchange for quoting scripture from memory. I don't remember any of the verses now, but I do remember being struck <clears throat> by the contrast between the theological world my neighbors inhabited and the world of our daily interactions together, in which if they thought I was going to hell, they certainly behaved as though it were no big deal, <laughs> or at least no obstacle to our friendship and no cause for immediate alarm. This is just as well. Whenever I have encountered someone who urgently wanted to save my soul, it has been really hard to extricate myself from the conversation with their unyielding and circular logic. You know what I mean. I know that you do. Meanwhile, my mom was working on her high school diploma at the local community college. I'm not kidding you when I tell you that she could still barely read when by some fluke or miracle in her history class, she came across a description of the Unitarian Church of the 1800s. And she was so impressed she decided to see if that unusual denomination still existed. She was ecstatic, she says, to learn that it did and that there was a church in downtown Portland, First Unitarian Church. It's still the most unlikely UU conversion story I've ever heard. <laughs> so when I was about seven years old, my grandmother, my mother, my sister and I started making the 45 minute commute to attend. My dad went a few times too, but he washed his hands of it after hearing a minister preach about gun control. <laughs> I was a pretty good shot when I was seven. <laughs> At our new church, I learned about the inherent worth and dignity of all people. I learned that we weren't the only ones who believed in theological diversity. I learned that if you dissect a frog in Sunday school, you won't find the spark of life in it, or a soul, or anything like that, just frog parts. And that made life seem very mysterious and fascinating. And before I left that church as a teenager, I saw a woman minister for the first time. She was preaching from our UU pulpit, Marilyn Sewell. I filed that information away in the back of my mind without thinking much about it, and with no idea that it would be relevant to my vocation later. I don't remember having any spiritual practices or praying or anything like that as a kid, except when we joined our extended family for dinner. Like our neighbors, they were, and still are, Christians. They were always as baffled by our creedless church as we were by their Pentecostal one, I think. <laughs> 
They might still be kind of baffled. I don't know. I think they listen to my sermons every once in a while. But what I think is true is that we agree on much more than we disagree on these days. Back then at family dinners, the language of Christ and the cross always seemed like an insurmountable barrier to me. A leap of faith distraction from what the UU Church taught me was Jesus' point, love and justice. When I became a teenager, everything changed. My parents divorced and my mom struggled mightily to stay on her feet. We moved into student housing in downtown Portland, just blocks away from the church. I had often felt out of place there among the other kids because of my cheap hand-me-down clothes and our inability to join in church events that required money. And now that my family was in crisis, it felt like a very lonely place to go. All the other families seemed so normal, with normal houses, not tin trailers, and parents who were teachers or doctors. I filed that information about the church away, too, with no idea that it would be relevant to my vocation. I tried joining a couple of different Christian churches with friends from high school. I even went on a mission trip to Mexico and tried accepting Jesus as my savior while our youth group sat around a campfire. I say tried because even though I said the words out loud and I really, really wanted to believe them with my whole heart, I wasn't satisfied by the theology of that group. I prayed, and I did begin to experience a feeling of someone or some spirit keeping me company in my life. But in the end, I was too edgy and rebellious for those conservative Christian youth groups, too put off by the language of the cross, and too Unitarian to think Jesus was really the only way to salvation. Next, I tried meditating according to the practices of Paramahansa Yogananda's Self-Realization Fellowship where my mom had started going. I remember sitting on my bed with my eyes closed, breathing and looking into the darkness within for that source of that feeling of company that I still experienced from time to time. But the darkness was dizzying, I thought. Silence didn't suit me. And going inward, I found at that time wasn't enough. At that time, I needed outward direction in life. And so I too landed in the category of spiritual but not religious, a non-churchgoer. For direction, I tried to go to college, but I didn't understand the financial aid forms. That's the truth. I didn't go to college until I was 24, because that's how long it took me to stop feeling intimidated by the application process. It's hard to believe now, because after that I was unstoppable but back then it was a real problem. Instead, when I was 19, I got married and became a mother. And I loved it. It was a very spiritual time for me. Pregnancy, labor and birth, tilling my garden, nursing my babies, and playing a part in blessing ceremonies for expecting friends. I had worked as a caregiver for several years and I continued this a few hours per week. When I was about five months pregnant with my son, I found myself standing at the foot of the bed of an elderly woman, very ill, who was also named Angela. To comfort her, I was rubbing her feet. And as I touched them, so aware that she was within days of death, I could feel my baby's feet kicking. The crown of my head tingled, and the hair on the back of my neck rose. I don't know how you would explain it, but I felt in that moment like a conduit for God. Having been raised UU, I had a very open idea of what God might mean. I couldn't have articulated it for you, but I felt I had experienced it, whatever it was. There would be two other times this kind of thing happened to me. They were a few years later. One was the night a good friend had her baby. She lived 50 miles away, and she called me when her water broke. She was having a home birth, and she wanted me there for support, so I headed over. But when I got there, the baby was already crowning, and the midwife hadn't arrived. So I tossed my car keys onto the floor and caught her baby with my bare hands. 
That was powerful enough. <laughs> but a few weeks later, something else happened, something very sad this time. My dad's new wife became unexpectedly ill, so ill that the doctors informed us she would die within days. She was only 43. I helped my dad arrange for her to leave the hospital and come home, since there was nothing they could do for her there anyway. And I was at her bedside, speaking a blessing to her with my hand on her forehead when she took her last breath. The whole room changed. The crown of my head tingled. Hair on the back of my neck rose. And I stared at my hands for days after that. Birth, death, blessing. Even though those years had been overall a pretty happy time in my life, I'd always had this low-level, nagging sense of, what was it? Restlessness? Ambition? I was finally in school part-time, trying to figure out what to do next. And I was at church, too. My kids had led me back, this time to a small Unitarian Universalist church in Salem, Oregon. I tried out various kinds of service and leadership there. I made coffee. I showed up at rallies. I even spoke once in a service for about 120 seconds. I was so nervous. How can you do this every week, I asked my minister. I could never do that. The folks at church were so nice and so welcoming. I just kept hanging around. I coordinated our part in a soup kitchen. I joined the pastoral care team. I performed in a church play. It was starting to get so that I was at church all the time. And then one day, as I was driving home from school and turning left onto Chamawa Road toward my house, I suddenly realized that I was going to be a minister. It was an out-of-the-blue realization. One minute, I'd never thought of it before, and the next minute, it was unavoidable, even though it was terrifying, and I figured everybody would think I was nuts. What kind of person decides that hundreds of people would want her for their minister, I thought to myself. I said it out loud to a few people to see if they would laugh, and I'd be off the hook, but they didn't, and I wasn't. Instead, what happened next was very surprising to me. I became a minister. <laughs> now, it took five years and a lot of work and a lot of grace. So much happened during that time. It's truly a whole other story, and someday I'll tell you all about it. But in the 200 words I have left right now, what I want you to know is how glad I am that I said yes to that call and how much it means for me for my spiritual autobiography to intersect with all of yours. To think with you each week about how to live in the world and help heal it and take care of your spirits in the process. To have the honor of you confiding in me about the meaning of your life and about fear and death and love. To do the nitty gritty work side by side with so many of you in our offices and meeting rooms so we can keep this place humming along and to see how much you give back and how much you pay forward. To be a leader in a welcoming church where it doesn't matter where you live or what kind of clothes you wear. To lead your weddings and your memorials and dedicate your children to shake hands with you in the receiving line or once in a while receive an email from one of you maybe for the first time ever, letting me know that this place means something to you, or that some words read or spoken from this pulpit touched your heart. Well, that is all just about enough to make the crown of my head tingle, too. However you want to define it as love or God or energy, the spirit moves in this place through you and me and all of us, and I'm so glad to be part of your story.